Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Bailey, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs at UNC Charlotte and past board member of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Carolinas. Welcome to our important and timely conversation tonight, discussing diversity, a place to begin. Might I also add happy May the 4th be with you to my Star Wars friends. Our program this evening is a partnership between the UNC Charlotte Belt College of Business Alumni Council and Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Carolinas. The two organizations identified a gap in resources for talking to children and family members about diversity, equity, and inclusion. While much programming and content has been focused around diversity and inclusion in the workplace and provided in the corporate setting, less guidance has been provided for our community relationships and discussions at home with the children in our lives. Big Brothers Big Sisters aims to provide additional training for their volunteer base of over a thousand plus adult mentors and the Belt College Alumni Council is eager to give back and help lead the discussion for the college's network of over 33,000 alumni. Both organizations recognize, affirm, and celebrate the diverse background, lives, and experiences of all their stakeholders. Our discussion this evening will focus on tips, suggestions, and ideas for talking to children and family members about diversity. By the end of our panel discussion, we want you to have new insight on how to bring up the important conversation of diversity with your family members or with children you mentor. Before I introduce our three panelists, I would like to extend a special thank you to the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Carolinas, Donna Dunlap, and Dean of the Belt College of Business, Dr. Jennifer Troyer. Thank you both. I'm also especially pleased to welcome Matt Foxhall, Executive Vice President of the Carolinas for Equitable and the sponsor for this evening's program, who will give a few brief remarks. Matt. Good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Matt Foxhall, and I'm the Executive Vice President for Equitable here in the Carolinas. Our mission at Equitable is squarely focused on helping our clients secure their financial well being so they can pursue long and fulfilling lives. My team and I work closely with the Equitable Foundation and specifically the social impact team to be a force for good in our local Charlotte community. Charlotte's home to our largest employee population with close to a thousand colleagues engaged and invested in ensuring this community is a vibrant and healthy place to work. I'm excited to welcome you to this informative virtual panel with big brothers, big sisters of Central Carolinas and UNC Charlotte Belk School of Business. We're also thrilled that our partner EverFi and Jesse Bridges is participating in this dialogue. We've worked with EverFi for a number of years, ensuring important curriculum like the topic we'll be discussing tonight on diversity, equity, and inclusion is available to all local school districts in our communities. We know that some of our friends from Charlotte Mecklenburg schools have joined us tonight. And this curriculum, uh, we're proud to say, has been made available to them at no cost to utilize in the upcoming 21-22 school year. With that, I'll turn it back to our esteemed moderator for this evening. Kevin, back over to you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you again to Equitable. Now, let me introduce you to our three panelists. First, I want to introduce you to Jesse Bridges. Jesse is the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for EverFi where she is the lead subject matter expert on DEI, representing thought leadership across their corporate, higher education, and K through 12 networks. Prior to joining EverFi, she served as the Senior Director of Organizational Culture and Head of Diversity and Inclusion at the Education Advisory Board, or EAB. Jesse has also served in higher education administration, most recently at Purdue University, as the Associate Dean of Students. Jesse, welcome tonight. Our next panelist is Amani Green. 
Amani has served as the coordinator of the Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Carolina's Beyond School Walls program since 2017. She knows firsthand the value of Big Brothers Big Sisters mentorship program as she participated in the program as a little sister before becoming a big sister herself. Prior to joining the organization, she served as an AmeriCorps VISTA leader for South Carolina Campus Compact. Welcome, Amani. I also want to introduce Solange Trikonowicz. Solange is the Assistant Director for Graduate Programs Enrollment, recruiting for the MBA program for the Belk College of Business. Previously, Solange worked as the Employer Relations Liaison for the college's graduate programs, connecting students to the talent development needs of the Charlotte area. Solange also leads diversity and inclusion initiatives for faculty and staff and serves on the recently formed Diversity and Inclusion Task Force for the Belk College of Business. Welcome, Solange. Those are three panelists for this evening. And before we begin the conversation, let me set the context. Since George Floyd's death and the subsequent protests, talking about race and our country's history with racism seems to have permeated the national conversation in the past year. Anti-racism books fly off the shelves so much that booksellers have trouble keeping them in stock. White public support for Black Lives Mattering is increasing. Yet since the George Floyd murder, we continue to see the murders of Black men, including Dante Wright in Minnesota and Andre Brown, excuse me, Andre Brown Jr. here in North Carolina. This conversation is unavoidable. As you know, many children may catch glimpses of these stories while the TV is on in the background, overhear conversations by adults, or may experience them on the socially distant playground in school. As adults have experienced, <clears throat> as adults have experienced, young children have no filter and may blurt out a question or observation. They are naturally inquisitive and may seek out the answers from an adult, or as an adult, you may want to initiate the conversation with the children in your life about diversity, but may not know what to say. This is why we are here tonight. We certainly can't do it all in 45 minutes, but we'll leave you with the resources to assist at the conclusion of this program. It will be recorded and the link to the recording along with answers to questions we don't get to in this webinar will be sent to all participants. So let's dive right in. I'll start with a few questions for each of our panelists. A little later, we invite you to take or uh, provide your questions in the chat and we'll get to them uh, as often as we can throughout the time we've got with you this evening. So first question, why is it important for everyone to understand how to weave these topics into the personal lives and conversations. Jesse, how about we start with you? Certainly, and thanks for thanks for the Kev, the question, Kevin. And um, you know, thanks to you all for creating the space for this conversation. And in some ways, I think you summarized the why really well in your beginning remarks that the conversation is unavoidable. Um, it, it permeates all of the spaces of the living, learning, and working communities that we occupy. And as adults who are interacting with and engaging with children, um, you know, we are the trusted adults in these communities and being able to feel confident about our ability to discuss these issues puts us in a more confident position to be able to support children as they're processing understanding what they're sensing. Children, as we all know, are remarkably perceptive. While they might not be able to articulate exactly what they're experiencing, they're picking up on what's going on in the atmosphere. And so being able to support them as they process what they're understanding, what they're experiencing by doing our own work um, makes it critically important that we do do that work, that we set the foundation of competence and confidence to be able to engage them. And uh, the last thing that I'll say before passing it over to my fellow panelists is that, you know, that, that ability to respect diversity, 
um, to respect a difference of opinion, of background, of belief systems, um, to engage with people who are different from yourself, that's a skill that has to be practiced. We are not innately born uh, running towards difference and embracing change. That's, that has to be cultivated. It's a skill that has to be honed. And the more that we can practice that, the more that we can model that for the children around us to create a more inclusive uh, community of belonging wherever we find ourselves. Solange? Yeah, so, you know, I think that Jesse makes a really good point about the, the fact that having difficult conversations and knowing how to navigate that is an important skill to learn. Now, while I don't think that there's ever kind of a low stakes opportunity, um, and we're certainly not in that situation anymore, you know, talking about racial injustice, talking about diversity and inclusion and equity, um, I do think that, you know, we're just at the place where the conversation has to begin. The topic is there. So now we have to opt into those conversations. So learning how to step into them um, is, is a, a skill that we need to build specifically um, in a natural way. You know, I think that there's, it's great that we continue to have these spaces where we're kind of formalizing these conversations. That's excellent. However, um, the more practice that we get making it normal and natural and unavoidable, I think the more impact that we can have, not only to um, our family members or to children, but also thinking about our colleagues and our loved ones. Um, there's a lot of audiences and populations that deserve to have this skill improved with each of us. So um, as much as we can learn how to not make it casual, but make it natural, I think the better that we'll all be. Thank you both. And so <clears throat> what I heard from, you know, your responses here is really a skill that has to be honed or built and we need to make it natural. Thank you. Move on to the second question then. What are adults saying they're having trouble discussing with children and family members? Amani, we'll start with you this time. Sure. Um, you know, Oftentimes, you know, coming from a, a place of big brothers, big sisters with that background, and of course it expands, um, but you know, oftentimes our bigs are a different race and socioeconomic status from their little, right? So they look to us for the tools that they need to talk about these issues when they're worried about saying the wrong thing. And really, I think that's what it comes down to for many of the adults that we work with, regardless of whether or not they identify culturally or socioeconomically with a child, um, regardless of if they're a big, you know, maybe a, a school member that we work with. But what it comes down to is they're worried about saying the wrong thing. Um, but regardless of that, you know, many of our, many kids, many littles we work with and kids in general, they're expressing strong emotions that are surrounding current events. Um, you know, for example, being really angry at police. Um, you know, those are really real things that kids are saying. And we want to make sure that the adults in their lives are able to validate their feelings and give them a comfortable place to express those feelings and to still ask more questions and learn. Solange? Yeah, and, and I'll add, you know, so I'm coming from this from more of a context of what it looks like when we're interacting with our peers, um, you know, whether at the workplace or perhaps, you know, um, some of you on the call might be mentors to, to older learners or to more mature learners. Um, I, some of the feedback that I've gotten in the work that I've done recently is that, you know, right, especially my white colleagues, they're terrified of saying something wrong or doing the wrong thing. Um, so that causes them then to go the other direction, which is to be silent. And we all know that silence also communicates something else loud and clear. Um, and often that's subject to interpretation and it doesn't necessarily work in your favor, especially as a white person. Um, but then on the flip side, some feedback that I've gotten from my black colleagues and other colleagues of color is that sometimes these conversations can hurt them and it re-victimizes them or it re-traumatizes them or puts undue pressure onto them to have to teach or supply knowledge or or to you know, guide white colleagues through these really difficult conversations. So I think all of us on some level are really struggling with 
how do I do this in a way that's helpful and not harmful? How do I do this in a way that's productive and in a way that, and I also can preserve my own, um, you know, sense of psychological safety. So I think all of us are in, in a place of trying to figure out how we navigate this. And so I think that in terms of trouble discussing um, these difficult topics, it's moving past the, being afraid to do something or say something. Okay, great. Jesse? Yeah, if I can just add add on to that, um, there's there's a, a quick data point at EverFi last summer in July, I believe it was July of 2020, we, we, we pulse surveyed um, over 400 educators. And we asked of those educators, what are the top issues that are impacting the students that you're working with today? And in recognizing we were at a really poignant point in time, um, the top two issues that those educators reported back in terms of what are the issues that are impacting your students? The first one was that of mental health and recognizing the moment in the context that life as we knew it had been remarkably disrupted, um, abruptly changed, um, you know, everything about our dynamics were shifted and, and collectively we all were experiencing an adjustment disorder. The second most impactful topic that educators said they found to be, you know, really kind of affecting their students were issues around diversity, equity, inclusion. And so what we saw was this really interesting heat map of what are the priority topics? It's talking about mental health. It's talking about topics of equity. And then we asked, you know, what are you most underprepared to discuss? And 87% of those educators who are engaging in these small group interactions said that the, what they, the 87% they felt that they were underprepared to have conversations about equity, about racial equity. Um, and so, you know, we pulled together our group of former educators and said, you know, what can we do and, and supplied and created, you know, some extension guides, some resource materials, but seeing that juxtaposition of this is a high priority. This is what is impacting students. And I'm coming into this conversation woefully underprepared to have the conversation. Um, you know, I think it really kind of outlines from a data perspective, everything that Solange and Amani um, just highlighted in terms of that discomfort. Um, but I wanted to underscore as well, Solange, what you said in terms of that the silence can be deafening. Um, it can communicate as much harm as, as saying, quote unquote, the wrong thing and not necessarily engaging courageously and authentically in the space of, of leading with empathy and, and positive intent, um, but knowing that you might not have the mechanics all the way right around the language that you're using. So let's uh, stay with this uh, for, for a moment. So as we talked about before, we will provide you know, resources um, for folks uh, at the conclusion and, and with the follow-up. And so, as I mentioned at the outset, there are books that are flying, you know, off the shelf. And so there are some, you know, resources out there. So you want to talk about race, uh, how, to, how to be anti-racist are a couple of uh, books off the top of my head that folks can avail themselves of. But uh, if we can stay on this topic of worried about saying the wrong thing and talking about how people might you know, overcome that. And I guess I'll go back to you, Jesse, because <clears throat> you talked about um, leading with positive intent uh, in, in that regard. So uh, even if you don't have all the language correct or all of the, the words um, precise, you need to lead with positive intent. So I'd like uh, anyone else to sort of chime in on, on that uh, notion. Sure, I'll, I'll add on to that, um, Kevin, I, I think, not I think, it, it's not only important to walk into a space and, and ask that whether that's a child or another adult that we assume positive intent about each other and, and the goal of the conversation. I think there's a critically important point before that is about asking for consent because everyone needs to be able and prepared to engage in that type of conversation, whether that is expressing curiosity about someone's lived experience, whether that is trying to gain a deeper understanding of a concept that you might not be familiar with and maybe haven't had the opportunity to do a little bit of your own homework, asking consent, um, because these are remarkably 
sensitive conversations, deeply personal conversations that can stir up a lot of things, you want to ensure that a person is prepared to engage with you in that way. And so I think, you know, step one, if we were to put it into a formula is, is, is ask for consent. And, and that could be, uh, I know that I messed up and I said something wrong and I want to make an apology. Are you prepared to receive that? Are you prepared to have the conversation about receiving an apology? And so once you have a place that there's mutual consent on all sides, you know, then you can move into a space of understanding positive intent and, and having the discussion from that point on and leading with authenticity. Um, you know, there's one, I'm a little bit of a, a research nerd when it comes to these dynamics. And so there's, there's one particular study about characteristics of inclusive leaders. Um, that was facilitated by Deloitte in 2017 or so. And, um, you know, while this talks about leadership in the framework of probably workplace cultures, I think it very much applies to how bigs engage with littles. Um, and some of those characteristics, there are six of them, and they like alliteration, so they all fall into the six C's of inclusive leadership. One of them is about cognizance of your biases. And, and that's the preparation that adults in particular should bring to the conversation is, is having done some of that self-work, pulling some of those books off the shelf to understand, you know, what are the areas that I need to investigate around the preferences I have, the biases that I have, um, you know, some of the self-work that I need to do. One of the other components around that, one of the other C's, if you will, is that of courage, of proactively inviting feedback for when you get it wrong because that sets the stage and creates the permission um, for other people to try out, to model, um, to practice where they might be clumsy in the mechanics around that language. And so, you know, that, that idea of consent, positive intent, understanding and having a cognizance of your bias, and then also expressing the courage um, to say, I may not get this all the way right, and I want you uh, to, to, to tell me, um, to tell me when I get it wrong and, and, and have, a, have each other meet, meet in that space. Anyone else want to add to that? Just one one other thing to add, and I think, it, you know, kind of even pre pre all of this is the idea of trust. You know, I think that trust is so essential in these conversations. And I, you know, we all know that there's different levels of trust, right? You might trust your romantic partner in a different way than you trust your coworker or your or your supervisor or whatever else it might be. But still, there's usually in human relationships some sort of baseline level of trust that we have one, with one another, where it's like, all right, I'm willing to go there with you. I'm willing to be vulnerable. I'm willing to receive your vulnerability. I'm willing to give it back. So being really aware of how you've built your relationship as a whole, including you know the dynamics of the relationship. Is this relationship hierarchical in any way? Um, is this relationship gonna have some sort of implications in the work that I do or the way that you see me later on? All of those things are really, really key into establishing a baseline level of trust so that you can even get there to the place of perhaps um, getting some consent to have that conversation. Great, great stuff. So I wanna remind people, uh, please feel free to put your questions uh, in the chat. We'll get to many, uh, as many of them as we can in the uh, time we've got left. And again, we will provide the answers to the unanswered questions when we follow up with you in writing with resources and a link to the recording. So let's continue this fantastic and timely uh, conversation. Uh, let's go on to the, the next question, which is, um, what is helpful to be aware of when discussing diversity with children from a different culture or background than your own? I'm happy to take this one first. Yep. Um, I think uh, first it's important to remember that everyone is living a different experience and therefore they're living their own truth. And we do not get to decide what other people's truths are. Um, and I think once you understand that, um, you know, then you can, you can move forward in your discussions, um, especially when it comes to being with children, um, you know, and, and circling back to that, um, is that we have to remember that it's not our role to impose our views on a child but rather we have to be there for them when they decide to share their perspectives with us. So, you know, a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, and it's happened plenty of times, you know, a child might say something to you that you don't necessarily understand or you don't necessarily agree with, but asking them to tell you more about it is a great place to start. Um, and coming 
to these conversations with children from a place of empowerment, um, to empower that child to ask those questions, to empower that child to start to form their own opinions and to form their own hopefully informed opinions. And that's what you know, Solange mentioned, trust. That child is coming to you and asking these questions or asking your opinion on something because they have a certain level of trust in you and they have a certain level of trust and respect and the answer that you're gonna provide them. Um, so just making sure that you're, you're coming from it from a place of empowerment for them, even if you don't understand or you don't agree. Um, that really, when you're working with kids, you wanna make sure that, you know, that you're really letting them be, be the leaders of their own decision-making. Why, Solange? Yeah, something I'll add, you know, I think that without a doubt, um, 2020 and 2021 have been really difficult years where we're seeing, you know, we're having these conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion under a context of a lot of injustices and, and, and oppression, um, which it's important. We should absolutely certainly engage with those conversations in that top, in that context. However, um, I think it's equally important, and I think especially for children, but I'll broaden the audience, to have these conversations in the good times too, right? To be able to celebrate differences and to be able to highlight the exciting things um, that diversity brings us. Um, you know, and I say, I think it's really easy to do for children, right? Like there are all kinds of festivals and, you know, arts and crafts and things that you can do. But I don't think it would, it's right for us to stop celebrating as children, you know? I think as adults, we tend to really focus in on, oh, we got to talk about dismantling this oppression, which we do. Um, but like at the same time, we can also just celebrate and, and talk about the happy things that different cultures and different races are bringing to the table in a way that we're not um, kind of making it that cool, weird alien thing, but in a way where we're just appreciating it for what it is, appreciating the people and, and the, the unique gifts that are offered. So talking about diversity in good times as well as in bad is important for all audiences, not just for children, but for adults as well. Alange, I could not, I could not agree more. And I'm so glad that you raised that point because we can come to the context of a conversation about diversity or difference or inclusion and only see that through the lens of a heightened emotion around fear and there are bad problems to address. And, and I remember distinctly um, at the end of 2020, EverFi has a course around black history that's intended for a high school audience because cultural literacy and understanding the cultural context of and historical context of how did we get here today? Uh, you know, these events don't happen in isolation. They're a part of a larger system. As we were revisiting that curriculum, I said to the team, it is remarkably important for us to keep in balance both the successes and the struggles of the Black experience and recognizing that that's not monolithic. It, because if we lose sight of the fact that there are remarkable successes, trailblazers, contributions that really ex exist and extend into today, um, then we're only going to center ourselves on the big problems that make the existing in an ecosystem of difference scary. Um, and so that, that joy and the success and, and the counterbalance um, to all of that, because there, there is still levity and joy to be found. We have to search a little bit harder in it sometimes um, for that context, I think, I think is, is so important. I'm really glad that you raised that point. Um, and you know, to that, as, you're, as we're thinking about you know, what's helpful to be aware of in discussing these topics, um, yourself, starting with self, and awareness of self and how you are showing up to the space, who you are in the lens of the multidimensional identity that you are viewing life through is one of the most critically important pieces of self work that we can do as adults who are engaging with children because you have to understand what sets you off, what gets under your skin, who are you naturally an ally to? What communities do you naturally ally yourself to? And who are those communities that you have to work a little bit harder to understand? Um, and so, you know, as, as I talked about that framework a little bit earlier, cognizance of your biases and the lens through which you're looking at life 
um, you know, that is really important self-work to be aware of because that's going to color the lens through which you're engaging with um, a child as they're having that conversation. Because based on your, as an example, your religious background, they might say something that really kind of makes the, ha the, the hair on the back of your, your neck stand up. And you've got to have you know, a, 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 a talk with yourself before you respond. Um, and so that mindfulness about who you are and, and what you're bringing to the space um, is also, you know, in, in context of everything that Imani and Solange said, another piece that I would add to the conversation. You know, so now we're getting, you know, we've got some, you know, rich uh, wisdom coming from our panels here in, in this piece. And, and, you know, this idea of starting with self and your own reflection and doing your own work, you know, as Jesse was saying, our panelists was also, were also talking about uh, trust, uh, cognizance, uh, courage. There are four other C's. We'll make sure we get you the six C package, you know, in the follow-up, but also have these conversations, you know, in good times, you know, uh, and in, in bad. You know, we've got a question in the chat here that I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, jump to. It is uh, how and when to best turn a conversation about uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ issues um, uh, and challenges into a conversation about and engaging uh, being an ally. How and when to best turn a conversation about BIPOC, LGBTQ, et cetera, issues and challenges into conversations about encouraging and being an ally. <clears throat> Anyone wanna? Take a stab at that. I'll begin. So um, number one, I do think that everything that we've mentioned so far, while we are you know, kind of focusing this conversation around racial diversity, I do think that these key skills are certainly transferable to other populations um, in terms of listening, building relationships, the idea of trust, you know, when it comes down to it, um, our identities are really, really personal. So those foundational skills are really important. Now, when you talk about switching the conversation from, you know, to, to highlight more about being an ally, again, I think that a lot of these things apply um, in terms of being cognizant of self, understanding who you are and um, what you may or may not be bringing to the table, whether you want to or not. You know, I think that whenever we talk about allyship we, um, and how we can be allies, we tend to be really focused on what we want to do, the intent of, I want to be there for, for you and for this population, not recognizing that we might be bringing along some of our baggage along the way. Um, we don't want to, we don't mean to, um, but it comes along with us anyway, right? We're human, that's what we do. So being really aware, I guess that's where the self-awareness comes in is that even though I'm coming in with a lot of strong intent, um, I might also be coming in with some other things that could be harmful. Um, and that's kind of the nature of being an ally. I think it's really important for all of us to recognize in the journey of allyship, um, it is, there is no final destination, right? You're not going to read X amount of books and listen to X amount of podcasts and be like, all right, I got it. Here I go. Um, it's going to be a constant adjustment um, and keeping in mind too, that you're gonna adjust with different populations. You know, we all as humans come with a different set of triggers, even within um, the same kind of community. You know, black people are not a monolith. Um, the LGBTQ community, not monolithic. There's a lot of different experiences in that. So even if you studied up and you say, all right, I know what to say and how to say it and when to say it, guess what? You're still gonna trigger somebody in some way. So the key part of developing um, that ally relationship is, is being humble and saying, okay, um, I think I might've messed up here. I apologize. Here's what I'm doing to learn and grow. Here's how I plan on, on moving forward. Um, that's really, really important in, in allyship. Very much agree. And I, I think that the how and the when to turn the conversation towards allyship is, is one, it's going to be highly dependent on the conversation you're having. So I don't know that there's any sort of formula that you can put behind, um, you know, insert ally moment here. Um, but I think if you're deploying the skills of active listening 
and listening with the intention to understand, many of us are listening with the intention to respond, period. We're waiting for our moment to insert whatever wisdom we're bringing to the table. But if we're, if we're genuinely listening with the intention of understanding and thinking about having a conversation with a child, you know, you're listening for, for understanding of, under, of comprehending where they are and what they're processing. I think those natural moments are going to evolve um, you know, somewhat organically. And you know, if, you're, if you're looking for illustrative language, you know, I, I have a six-year-old daughter and we were actually having a conversation last night. Um, so it feels relatively timely. There's a book that she has that we're reading through and it's called Her Story. And so there are examples of, of lots of women throughout history and contemporaries um, who are making an impact in their own particular way. And there was one example of, of, a, of a young lady who is transgender. And she had this moment where she was trying, she was grappling with the understanding of how is one born anatomically a boy and lives their life as a girl. And, and that's not my experience. And she said, that's, that's weird to me. And I said, well, it's different from you. And so let's talk about the distinguishing factor between weird and different. And I think that was for me because I was listening on how she was processing a way to say, now let's kind of pivot our language a little bit from being strange and foreign and bad was the connotation to it is different from your own experience. It doesn't make it bad. It just means that it's something you're not familiar with. But how could we learn more about that? Do you want to read the story again? I'm not saying that as a pat on my own back. I mess it up plenty. But it was, you know, one of those moments where you can listen into what the student is saying or what the child is saying and take that what feels like a, an assignment of value um, to someone else's life or another person's community and say, well, let's let's diagnose that. Let's talk about that a little bit more. And it might be different or unfamiliar, but how can we learn more about that community? How could we learn more about that person? Um, and so I think, you know, those are some of the natural moments, but active li listening is going to be the key in, you know, knowing the timing around when to engage. I think that is a, a, a perfect segue, the story with your daughter uh, leading to one of our, our questions. What is the best way to respond to children's questions and comments about differences, even when we're not sure what to say? I think in Jesse's uh, example, um, you were, you know, sure what to say, and part of it was, you know, correction of language, you know, weird, you know, versus versus, um, you know, different, um, and making sure that we've got the correct language when we're describing, particularly if the child presents us, you know, in their way in their language, then they, they may not, you know, have the um, nuance to understand the difference, but to correct them and, you know, give them that education and that ability to want to learn more about why that person, you know, is different. Uh, panelists, anything else to add to that uh, uh, answer? Yeah, I think, uh, Jesse, I think that was a really great point too, you know, about, you know, if you want to start to respond to a question or a comment that the child says is to be actively listening, um, and you know, with your daughter in that example, you also know her and you can infer that when she meant weird, she meant different. And, you know, you also mentioned this before because sometimes we can't always infer that, especially if it's a child that we don't know as well. Um, and so it's never wrong to ask a question. You know, I'd always say to her, so what did you mean by that when you said weird? Well, I mean, I've never seen anything like that. Okay, now we can start to understand that what they're trying to say is different and use a shift in language. Um, and when it comes to just having these conversations in general, and especially when you're not sure what to say, I think you should always start by asking a question. Um, you know, for example, um, if a child says to you, like, you know, my little sister, like, oh, did you see what was on the news? Or did you hear about blank? Well, first I wanna say to her, well, which part or of the news or, uh, what about it? Like, did you hear about this, that? But I say, well, what about it? Because when I first ask her that, you know, it allows her to form her own interpretation of what it is that she's seeing or hearing or experiencing. Um, and then once she has that foundation of an interpretation um, or any child, you know, I'm using my little as an example, but once they have that, that feeling of interpretation, then I'll say, okay, so, you know, how did you feel about that and why? Uh, you know, and then 
when you ask that, it gives a better example and it, it makes it more clear. What are they really wanting to know or what are they really wanting to get out of this conversation that they're starting with you? Um, so, you know, starting with asking a question is definitely something um, that I would always suggest starting with. Um, I'd also want to add that it's definitely okay to not have an answer right away. If you don't feel comfortable with an answer, um, you can simply like as simple as, I mean, you know, as simple as it is say, you know, I'd like to take some time to think before responding or, you know, sometimes kids are understanding, but if, if that's the case, I think as both of the panelists, uh, both my co-panelists mentioned before, is that the important thing to remember though, is if you don't know and you, you don't feel comfortable with that answer, is to not shut it down or avoid it completely. Because once you do that, or you shut it down, or you show that you're anxious about it, or you show that you're uncomfortable talking about it, that teaches the kid right away that it's not okay to talk about differences. It's not okay to have these challenging conversations. Um, you know, and, and that's definitely something we want to avoid. We want the, the child or the, any person we're talking about, you know, regardless of if it's a child, um, you know, whether it's a really young child or a teen, um, we want them to feel comfortable to ask these questions and, and to keep doing it. So even though it's okay to not know everything, because certainly I don't, you know, I, I try to learn, but while I don't have everything, the most important part I think is to not shut it down. And certainly don't make up an answer. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, certainly for the, uh, you know, parents in, in the, the room um, or people who have kids in their uh, lives, the question about where do babies come from? It's coming if it hasn't already. Uh, and so, again, you know, that is perhaps an example uh, of uh, a question that you don't want to come. They come from the store. You know, you don't want to make stuff, you know, mixed up. Uh, up and again, if you're not prepared because you're um, shocked, you know, again, don't make it up and let me think about it and you know, and get back to you. Okay. Any, anyone else want to add? There's there's one additional tactic that I would suggest, and then Solange, I saw you self, take yourself off mute as well. Is provide it as an opportunity to model that you are a lifelong learner. Let's explore that together. We have these beautiful devices that are full of information called the Googles. And you, know, you might wanna do a little pre-work, but I, I, I've deferred before and I've said, you know, I don't actually know much about that, but let's write down that question and let's explore it later together. And it gives me one, the opportunity to do a little background research beforehand, but then also it's engaging in a way that demonstrates and models, it's okay to learn. It's okay to explore. It's okay to seek deeper understanding and we can do that together. Um, so that's that's the only tactic that I would suggest in addition to um, you know, not shutting the conversation down, not giving the wrong answer, and then whatever wisdom Solange is about to drop on us. No, the only other thing I want to add, I think this is so important that these skills are not just directed towards children. You know, I think of experiences that I've had as an adult where I'm asking um, my my supervisor, my boss, you know, some questions around, what is what are, what is our organization doing around diversity and inclusion or you know even you know something not quite as um uh dense as diversity and inclusion there's a very clear signal whenever my boss shuts the conversation down or provides me with information that i can definitely tell they kind of pulled out of nowhere right so i think it's really important that as adults we I, we learn how to say i don't know um but i'll learn more or asking questions Hmm, why are you interested in that? Is this something that is passionate for you? Can we develop you in this way? You know, there's a lot of ways and, you know, it's so interesting. I think that we're centering this conversation around, around children, but gosh, there's so much to learn <laughs> um, and for us to hold on to as adults, as we navigate our adult relationships and all of this. Um, it's, it's not just, in fact, perhaps we need to think a little bit more um, in our adult interactions. You know, how would I approach this if, if it was coming from the innocence of a child, how would I want to preserve that relationship and that sense of trust? Um, because I do think that will be better for it. Right, right. So, so the, the question was posed, uh, what if the child brings up uh, or a person brings up the question, what about the reverse? If you want to initiate the conversation with an adult or a child, um, what advice would you give? I, 
I will always default to books. <laughs> if you, I mean, one, because I just think that reading with a child, um, almost regardless of, of age is a, is a way to engage and to store and to share a story together is, is a powerful connecting experience. And even if the topic of that book is not about diversity, you'll be able to notice and pick up, you know, is there a diversity of characters throughout the book? Or maybe there's not. And that's the point at which you can say, huh, you know, it's interesting that everyone on this page kind of looks alike or they act the same way. What do you think about that? I, I, you know, I think it again, it's about being kind of uh, culturally intelligent, emotionally aware and tuned in, um, which, you know, in, in the state of constant engagement, that's, that's hard. It's hard for me at times when I'm reading a book with my daughter and my phone is going off and I, I'm trying to be present. And so I think like, the first condition is, is find yourself to be present and engaged. Um, but, you know, I think there are everyday moments and scenarios where you're going to pick up something that's going on in the atmosphere and sort of, as, as Imani highlighted earlier, asking and posing a question and engaging their opinion. One of the other C's, Kevin, is about cultural intelligence and curiosity. <laughs> and so real. expressing, yeah. <laughs> I'm feeding them to you, breadcrumb trail at a time. Um, but, but really expressing intellectual curiosity and posing questions almost rhetorically and aloud to have them to respond to, um, you know, that can be a natural and organic way to start to engage them in a conversation about diversity and empathy and perspective taking and, oh, I wonder what it would be like um, to be in this character's shoes. Because perspective taking, the, ab the ability to put yourself figuratively in the shoes of another person leads to empathy which is a cornerstone of teaching about inclusion. And so if you can find those moments to talk about perspective taking and what would it be like to be in that person's lived experience or to live in their house or to be a part of their neighborhood or to be a part of that club, that's a way to start to cultivate that interest that doesn't feel like, and now we're going to have a diversity lesson because there's no easier way to turn a child off and to make them feel like you're about to school them and lecture them. I'll add, I think it's really important to, I mean, the basics, right? Thinking about where do you go to the grocery store or um, the movies or TV shows that you watch, or, um, uh, you know, even if it's, you know, where you're going shopping, things like that. Children notice that people look different. And I think it's our job to say that those differences are for one, they're there, they're around us and they're good. And they're okay, you know. Um, I think of a time where I was interacting with a child, and you know, she read my skin. She said, "Your skin is different than mine." Yes, yes, it is. That's right. Um, and just you know, you can build a conversation from there. I don't think that. I think it's a problem whenever kids aren't bringing up those differences. Then you know that wait, I need to start diversifying what I'm consuming or where I, you know, the environments that I am in. If, if kids are in the, that environment where differences are present, they're going to ask questions about it. And then that's a perfect opportunity for you to, to, to step into that conversation a little bit further. So just taking note of like, what, what is around me? Is everything around me the same? Does it look the same? Is it, am I around, you know, a lot of people that look like me or speak like me or, you know, celebrate the same holidays? And how can I make that a little bit different from, you know, these bigger instances like going to big festivals or something that's a little bit more extravagant to just at the grocery store who's who's around me what do they look like yeah and i i would say and oh no imani please go ahead no <laughs> um I, I was i was going to add that um you know diversity doesn't necessarily have to be aesthetic and so there are also those moments as an example i'm left-handed and my daughter is right-handed. And so I use those moments, which feel you know, kind of insignificant, if you will, to talk about lived experience and what that's like. I talked about how I would have to like shove myself in the lecture hall desk in college. And, you know, the, the mark she asked me one day, like, Why, what's wrong with your finger? And I said, well, you know, I have a pin that isn't made for left-handed people. And so just understanding, you know, the difference in experience and how people walk through life 
that's different from your own, it doesn't always have to be about race or gender identity. It, it can be as simple as, you know, left-handedness and right-handedness. And I used this example one day with her about iPhones and how they were turned and they weren't made for people like me. <laughs> and, and so I think there, there are those smaller moments um, where you can leverage your own story. And I think it's really powerful to, to use your own story and your own experience as a vehicle um, to bring up the topic of diversity in, in ways that, that feel natural and connecting between you and the child. And I also don't wanna constrain it. I, I talk a lot about my six-year-old daughter, but I don't wanna constrain it to just younger children. I've had this conversation as a, as a college academic advisor and a previous admissions counselor and, and talked about that with high schoolers through the lens of, you know, what do you think the next chapter of your life is going to look like? You're going to a community college or you're going to a four-year college or you're going to the military and you're leaving a community that feels remarkably familiar and known to you. And what do you think um, that's going to be like for you to be a part of a community that is so varied geographically people are coming from lots of different places you know where you know how do you imagine that you'll be able to to manage that and what are you excited about what are you a little bit afraid about so i don't want to constrain it to just those who are in the single digits in their lived experience but i think you can have this conversation with high schoolers as well no i i completely agree and you know i definitely um understand that i i definitely love the point that both of you kind of mentioned about the celebrating it every day but also in ways of subtlety it doesn't need to be a discussion that you're kind of you know like okay we're gonna learn about this let's sit down pens and paper you know um but also you know and and that's that's great i think for kids that you feel connected to that you have maybe a deeper relationship with. Um, but I also just want to add one last point, if I may, about, you know, maybe, for example, if you are a big in a program or you're a mentor in another in another way is to remember, um, I think, to remember sometimes uh, not to impose these conversations on kids. Um, Solange mentioned it in the way beginning of the panel um, that some of her black colleagues might talk about being exhausted, having to relive things, you know, um, and, you know, taking it to the context of children is to remember that sometimes, you know, in your role as a mentor is to just be a friend to them and just to let them be a kid um, and to support them, you know, in terms of a child to support a child when they're having these inner turmoils or these inner conversations with themselves and allowing an outlet to express those things, but not, you know, not imposing these conversations onto them when they're not ready for them. And, and again, that goes circles back to what we talked about in the way beginning, um, you know, as Solange and Jesse both mentioned, um, you know, forming, making sure that trust is there and that sort of thing. Um, but I do, I, you know, agree with all the, the subtlety and all of that as well. Um, but definitely just remembering that you know, let them take the time when they're ready to sometimes. This is a fantastic conversation. I can't believe we've only got seven minutes left uh, in this. We could certainly talk uh, for another hour, uh, at least about this topic. Um, let me go to what I think is the last question in the chat that I wanna get to. Um, and panelists, we could be brief with, with the answer. The, the question in the chat is around uh, a person uh, wanting to be there um, want to be there for um, the diverse partner in business. How do you suggest I start to be an ally in the workplace? I want to be there for my diverse partner in business. How would you suggest I start to be an ally in the workplace? Solange, would you like to go first? <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is, a, it, it's certainly a, another resource that I'll pass along. Um, so I can't take credit for, for the ideas that I'm about to, um, to suggest, but um, I believe it was an article in Forbes late last year that talked about what does it take to be an ally in the workplace? And uh, the first component, there are four, and I don't know that I'm gonna recall all four of them, but again, I will pass along the resource after to participants. But the first is understanding your power, um, recognizing the places of power and privilege that you have within that workplace setting. And it could be you know, managerial level that you have a dynamic where you're, you're of a, a different or more tenured or more senior managerial level than the person um, that, you're, that you're referring to. 
it could, it could mean, you know, there's a racial dynamic um, and certainly recognizing the power that you have provide you with a lens by which we you know, where you need to be an ally. Um, I think diagnosing what allyship means and doesn't mean is also critically important. Um, you know, sometimes that looks like um, passing the mic and allowing that person to speak for themselves from a place of empowerment. Sometimes it does mean speaking on their behalf. Um, and other times that means turning your mic off and being quiet and listening and learning. Um, oftentimes we think about allyship from a lens of, you know, I'm using my megaphone to speak on behalf of a, a person or a community. And sometimes it is being quiet and listening um, or it is creating that space or giving up your seat at the table so that they can, um, you know, be the person who is, is seen as the contributor of their ideas. Um, you know, another element of that is being authentic. And, and we've threaded that throughout this entire conversation of understanding, you know, what you know and what you don't know and being courageous and you know being able to state that um, clearly and the last point and solange you hit on this and i think it it certainly could bring its own panel discussion about is about cultivating psychological safety am i using my power to create spaces where someone can fully contribute without fear of retribution or losing their status and am I blocking and tackling and making those spaces psychologically safe for people to be able to contribute? So those are some quick suggestions. I, I certainly, I know that Imani and Solange have more to add, so I'll pause there. We've got two minutes, Alice. Real briefly, um, I think everything that Jessica said is spot on. The last thing that I'll add is don't feel the need to fix their problems. You know, I think another topic that we can talk about for a long time is this white saviorship. And I think that is really, really important, especially in the workplace that we really have to distance ourselves from. Um, the idea that, okay, since I have this power, I'm gonna lead the charge and, and do all these things to make sure that this person gets everything that they want or that they need. No, I don't, I don't think that it's as easy as that, unfortunately. I think it requires a lot more listening, a lot more and getting to know that person as an individual and recognizing that some of the things that they want or that they need, you might have just taken for granted, you know, and that perhaps their white colleagues are, are, um, are just are not getting, but they just need a little bit more support in that specific avenue. So be really wary of the white saviorship and then take the time to listen and understand and, and recognize that some of their needs might be very, very basic. It's just that because of who they are um, and their identities, they just don't have access to getting those basic needs met. So if I can just say one last thing. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. All right. I, I love, you know, all of these points, Solange, um, exactly this idea of this white saviorship, but also in recognizing the power that you have, as Jesse mentioned earlier, is to recognize how that white saviorship might look for you. Maybe you might or may not be a white person, but you're you're showing this when you say, I want to be an ally for LGBTQ as a heterosexual. And you know, I'm gonna make my voice big and, and that sort of thing. I have this power here, so I'm gonna do that. So recognizing how you also can transfer that and the power and looking at the power that you have and, and trying not to fall into that. Um, again, we could go on uh, forever and maybe this will be the spur for part two. I'm not, I'm just saying, um, but I want to thank Jesse Bridges from EverFi, Amani Green with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Carolinas and Solange Strakonowicz from the Belt College of Business. We've talked about six C's. We've talked about starting with self. We've talked about leaving your truth. Um, we've talked about active listening and not making it up, and uh, it's okay not to have uh, an answer. Uh, I like the quote, uh, there is no final destination in the journey of allyship, um, and many more uh, things that we have covered this evening. Again, we will send you additional resources about how you can read and take action and, and be an, an ally. You'll get the recording. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Again, want to thank our panelists. This concludes our session. Thank you for coming again and good night.